So the word for tonight, which is our first week of this, is sober. So I want to talk to you about this word and kind of open it up for a minute. The, what happened to me this afternoon about, uh, I don't know, this is about an hour and 10 minute conversation. It was with my friends at DirecTV. And all I was, all I was really trying to do with DirecTV was get them to add the ACC network for me. One little thing, right? So I call them up, I go, listen, man, I've been, a, you know, you always pull out the card. I'm like, I've been a customer of yours for 20 years. Uh, just want to know if you could maybe add the ACC network for me. I'm like, uh, I'm a fan and uh, this ACC team. And so I go, uh, I go, uh, you know, I, I know that it's got to be, in theory, you're supposed to add some other package, but I just want to know if you could work that out. And, you know, then, well, Mark, you know, they never, it's going to be every possible accent you can imagine you're going to get on this call, right? But in this one, it was like the, well, Mark, you know, how do you like, how do you like DirecTV? I'm like, well, I could find if I could just get the ACC network, you know, can we like move on? And then, of course, what happens is, this is my favorite part of the whole thing, the whole operation. When you call them, you get an automated answer. And the answer goes, would you please tell us your um, phone number? So you tell them your phone number. Is that the number that's associated with your account? Yes. Can you tell us your address? Yes. 12421 Sparta Lane. Can you tell us your city? Knoxville, zip code 37934. You're good, right? You get the live person. Hello, Mark. Can you tell me the number associated with the account? You go, yeah, here you go again, the whole thing, right? Can you tell me the city, the address, blah, 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 blah. Are you Mark Beebe? It's like, no, I'm Jack the Ripper. Yes, I'm Mark Beebe. So then she can't handle the call. Then you get the next person. Well, guess what they ask you? Can you tell me the phone number associated with the account? Like, you're like, what do you people do with the freaking number? What do you do with the address? What happens to this stuff, I'm telling you. By now, let me just tell you, 40 minutes into the call, trust me when I tell you this, I was absolutely drunk with frustration. <laughs> Amen? I'm telling you that story because I want to expand the conversation tonight where we, if, if we're sitting in one of these seats tonight and we think that this conversation isn't for us because we're never drunk and so we don't really have to ever worry about being sober, I'm going to challenge that tonight in every way I possibly can to every single one of us in this room. There is no doubt in my mind that at 1.40 this afternoon, I was drunk with frustration because I had thoughts of what I would do if I was in that direct TV office to the persons that I was talking to. I had bad intent, right? I mean, the thing was I needed their stupid network, so I was having to sit there and be nice, which probably caused me five years of stress on my life. Because I didn't want to tell, I mean, I didn't say what I really wanted to say, right? That it upped the frustration. I was drunk with that. Like, you can clearly be drunk with codependency. You can be drunk with worrying about somebody else. It can have the exact same effects on you. You can be drunk worrying about a relationship. How many people know somebody right now that is dating somebody and they are so obsessed with them, they don't even know which way is up because that person, the way they react this afternoon or tonight or whatever, is gonna affect them that way, amen? Like, they are so far into it, they don't know which way is out. And their barometer of how they're doing emotionally is 100% affected by this person. Am I right? 100% affected by this person. Maybe it's not somebody you're dating. Maybe it's some other kind of relationship. Maybe it's your job. There are a million things that can make you drunk. What does that mean? You are revolving around that reality as being your everything. You are revolving around that current reality as being your everything. And so what does sober look like with that? Well, you know, I want you to think about the sober versus drunk in the terms we're talking about now and how much wider that is. Like, do chemicals define drunk? I say they do not. I say drunk is a state of mind, and I say more importantly, drunk is a state of the heart. I mean, if I, if I really, if I really wasn't, uh, if I really didn't have a set of expectations about 
thinking I should get the ACC network for free, if that wasn't my presupposition about the call, the call still would have been bad because they would ask for my number 90 times, but it wouldn't have been as bad because see, what I went into there with was an expectation and they were gonna meet it until they weren't. And the best part of this whole story is, so finally I get the lady down to adding whatever it is she had to add. You're gonna love this. And so she gets, I get it down to $2, $2 more a month. That's what we settle on. I try to, she goes, this chase will show up in about a minute and a half. If not, reset your box. I reset the box two times. I call them back. Go through the whole rigmarole again. It's like God laughing at me, right? Going, watch this, sucker. You're gonna have to give him your phone number again three times. It's gonna be so much fun. Let me see if his head blows off. This is great. I get all the way through it. You know what the guy tells me? Well, Mark, I mean, the thing is, the reason you're not getting the ACC network is because we're still in negotiations to be able to stream it. I'm like, you sold me a network you don't even freaking have. I love it. Like if you're a salesperson, that's the best, isn't it? I'm gonna sell you this window I don't even have. Love it. Do chemicals make you drunk? They do, but there's a lot of other stuff in our life that gets us there, amen? Here's a quote from Brene Brown. She writes a lot of books that I think are unbelievably helpful. I once heard she said someone say, now listen to this, abstinence-based recovery, meaning like I, I'm not gonna work on why um, I have such high expectations. I'm gonna work on biofeedback and calming myself before I talk to DirecTV, right? I'm not gonna really address the heart issue. I'm only gonna address my behavior with DirecTV. Are you following me? That's abstinence-based recovery, meaning the goal of recovery is for you to stop using your drug or obsession, in my case today, expectations, obsession of choice. Are you following that? That will be the goal of abstinence-based recovery. I'm gonna stop doing the behavior that I was doing. She goes, abstinence-based recovery is like living, now listen to this, is like living with a caged, raging tiger in your room. If you open the door for any reason, you know it's gonna kill you. You're living on borrowed time, basically she's saying. The non-abstinence-based addictions are the same, like the one I'm talking about, but you have to open the door to that cage three times a day. Are you following that? You're gonna, you're gonna go into work, come back, et cetera, et cetera. You're gonna open the cage to that door three times a day because it's not gonna be as obvious as drugs or alcohol, but just as damaging, just as damaging. I mean, what we wanna do here, it really has nothing to do with teaching you about abstinence at all. I don't, I don't think that'll help any of us at all, amen? I think this is not a behavior issue. This is a heart issue. We talked about that last week in the, fam- the, the friends and family class. We're gonna talk about enabling tonight. Um, but I don't think that's the issue at all. The issue is the issue of the heart. And the issue of the heart is the same for all of us, every one of us in this room. There's nothing really peculiar in, in that regard about drugs or alcohol. So it's a wider conversation. Is the surrender... If I were to ask you, say, could you, could you, Mark, give up your, your whole dealing with expectations? Could you do it? Could you give up your obsession with expectations? You know, well, in my pride, I would go, probably go, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I could probably do that. I mean, I could like learn to go, I could learn to be like passe about, I mean, I might be dead in two hours, but I mean, I could learn to be passe about stuff, go, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's fine. I mean, let's, uh, we're going to have it, not have it, whatever. I mean, it's really all right either way. I could do that for a while. That would be my, would be one of my drugs of choice. I mean, I, unfortunately, I mean, I've got more than one to, to play around with, so that's good, I guess. But is the surrender of our drug of choice or our obsession of, cho- of choice the hardest surrender that Jesus is going to ask us for tonight when it comes to being sober? Like, is the hardest thing he's going to ask you to give up the thing you are currently obsessed with right now tonight? Is it? Or is it going to be some kind of a trauma or event you've been through? Is it going to be a piece of your history? Is it going to be something about your pride? Is it going to be something broken in your heart? Is it going to be a fear that you have? Is it going to be 
Is it gonna be a lot of other things other than the thing that you're using to accommodate your pain with? Is it gonna be your pain? Is it gonna be your pain? Heard another story this week from someone who's, who's got, uh, has got a son, alcoholic, been an alcoholic for 20 some years now, tells me the story, well, you know, this kind of started with, um, it's kind of started when his mom died, you know, when he was in his, it was in his late teens. And he really kind of went off the rails then, he said, I was like, well, what else happened to him? Well, when he was 12, um, this older adult male molested him. Mm -hmm. which, would, which would be harder for that, this, this, this guy to be able to give up? Would it be the alcohol? Or would it be the pain of that molestation? Which is gonna be the harder surrender? Which is the one that he's on the run from? What are you on the run from tonight? Whatever it is you're on the run from tonight, that's gonna be a much harder surrender than whatever it is you're using to stay on the run. Am I making sense? A much harder surrender. The real surrender is gonna be the surrender of the heart and whatever is broken in the heart is what you're trying to avoid surrendering and that's why your obsession is doing a mighty fine job helping you make that happen at least for a while and things go to crap. Which is the harder surrender? See, the surrender of our obsessions, just the first surrender. But to understand getting sober, you know, like we talk about clean and sober and everyone assumes when we use the words clean and sober, we're talking about like clean of alcohol, clean of drugs, clean of opiates, whatever. It's like, no, we're talking about clean of brokenness, clean of pain clean of stuff inside of us that we are ashamed of, clean of failures, clean of low self-understanding, clean of low self-worth, clean of all of the stuff that the enemy is using tonight to wreck you, clean of that. The surrender of the obvious is just the first. Sobriety, getting sober, getting clean and sober for any of us requires at the least, just to get started, confession and repentance. You, step one is basically going, God, I have been living my life thinking I am the queen of the world. I have been living my life as a victim as a victim queen or as a victim king, believing that I am the center of the universe and that my problems and the stuff that is trashing me are the significant problems in the world today. And I've also been living my life, God, believing that I'm gonna be the one to fix it if I feel like it. And also, God, for that matter, I don't really think what's happening to me is all that bad. Because see, really, God, I don't know how sick I really am. I mean, if people have tried to tell me but I don't really know how sick I really am. And I don't know really how sick I want to let on to be in either. And you know what, God, I don't know if I really trust you. That's like how these confessions begin. They get right down to it with God to the point that eventually you begin to actually trust God. And you know what you do next? As a part of your confession, as a part of repentance, you gotta, you gotta look at your hands and you gotta go, you know what, God, I mean, actually, um, like uh, the world is not in my hands and um, I'm not in charge and what is happening to me is overpowering me. The guilt that I feel is overpowering me, whatever it is, it's overpowering me, God. And I'm powerless over what's happening. All that, all that is what happens in, in step one. Sobriety is about living with a clear mind having the freedom to finally live with a clear mind and a clear heart. A clear mind and a clear heart. Clarity is a gift, man. Clarity is a gift. You know, like, as, as uncomfortable as it is to go through a little dealy, like, well, like I was talking about this afternoon, like, it's a gift to be able to go, am I actually getting frustrated by this call? Like, one thing that happened is the first time I called him to deal with all this, God gave me one clarity gift because somebody else that I had to talk to called in the middle of that call 
and I had to hang up. So really, there were three times I gave him my stuff. But the first time, it was probably a gift because I probably would have never got to call number two. Clarity is a gift. Being able to see clearly what is happening and to listen clearly to what people are saying to you, that's a gift. What is clarity all about? Well, here we go. Number one, like I was saying, in the confession and repentance part of this, I become aware of my powerlessness. I become aware of my powerlessness. I'm not gonna enjoy it, but I become aware of my powerlessness. So I'm codependent, I become aware, this is what we're gonna talk about tonight in this class, I become aware that there is nothing I can personally do to make somebody in my life do what it is I think they ought to do. Now, I cannot feed the disease they're in, but there's actually nothing I can do to make them do something that they don't wanna do. Number two, I seek a healthy and an honest sanity. Clarity means I seek, I look for, I want, I ask for a healthy and an honest sanity. Number three, this is a hard one, man. I increase, this is what step three is all about. I increase my trust in God. Now for some of us, this, this really won't be as hard as it looks because some of us right now tonight have zero trust in God, amen? God has burned you as far as you see it. God has rejected you. God has left you for dead. God has made a bad decision. God has made a bad, made a bad show in your life of something. And for you, for you to say you're gonna increase your trust in God, that would mean that you would spend more than a second and a half with him a day. That you would actually turn around and face him for 10 seconds. You know, that's like what, that's really what prayer for a lot of us is, isn't it? It's like I'm walking away from God, walking away from God, walking away from God, and for 10 seconds, I say something to God like, God, you know, I just um, want you to sort of be in my day. Or maybe you turn around, maybe you turn around, this is a part of trust. Maybe you turn around and you go, God, we're gonna have a talk because I'm gonna spend the next hour explaining to you how disappointed I am in you. And I wanna talk to you, God, about all the stuff you have done to hurt me. You know, have you ever thought about that being a prayer? Have you ever thought about that increasing your trust in God? You know how it increases your trust in God? Because God will listen, God will understand, and the most important part, God will love you even more for that kind of a prayer than you just continuing to walk away like this. I increase my trust in God, and eventually, I place myself in his arms. I place myself in his arms. Have you ever seen, you know, this is, I used to do this with my dad, you know, like all of my sisters and brothers did. Have you ever seen a little kid, you know, like, like a 2T or a 1T kid, you know, that size? Like, have you ever seen them get up into the, um, get up into the arms of a mom or, or, or a large dad? Now, like that mom or large dad can pretty much crush a 1T kid, amen? That kid simply believes in the love of that parent. That kid simply trusts in the arms of that parent. That kid doesn't believe there is risk involved because that kid believes that that parent is only gonna love them, amen? I mean, for some of you, you didn't have that experience you know, in your life growing up, but you know what? You need that experience from somewhere, and I wanna beg you to please take it from God, your Father, tonight, that has demonstrated his loving arms for you in the cross of Jesus, where he allowed his own son to shed blood and die for you, because of you, and because maybe tonight nobody has ever been trustable in your life that they can put their arms around you, and you're gonna say, this is good, and I trust this, and if that's true for you, I know that Jesus is here tonight to do exactly that. Amen? I know that. I increase my trust in God and eventually I place myself in his arms. Next piece of clarity, I become honest. I become honest about what's happening to me. I become honest about my obsession. 
I become honest about what has control over my life. I become honest about what I'm afraid of. I become honest about what I'm ashamed of. I become honest about what I'm on the run from. And next, I become connected. I become connected to other people that God is gonna show me how to trust, that God is gonna put in my life. And second of all, I become connected, more deeply connected to God. Six, I learn gratitude. I learn how to be thankful. For most of us that are really angry tonight, this is really a rugged piece of work. This part of clarity is a rugged piece of work that I become grateful. For what? I don't feel anything to be grateful about. Can you be grateful for just being alive? The next one, I serve. I am free enough to serve somebody else. If it's only for 10 minutes, I'm free enough. Clarity tells me there are other people out there in need besides me. And if I help them to meet a need, if only for 10 minutes, you know what? They're gonna feel better. I'm gonna increase my sense of worth and I'm gonna feel better. And you know what else that's gonna happen to me? Out of gratitude and serving, I'm gonna discover some hope. Here's a great quote. Sobriety requires the death of my toxic identity and the birth of an identity that is entirely new to me. Sobriety, this is mine actually, sobriety requires the death of my toxic identity, the stuff in me that's keeping me sick and the birth of an identity that is entirely new to me. You know, like if you ask people that are sober tonight, you say, hey, when you were in the middle of your active compulsion, did you sort of have a hint? Did you sort of have a, a, a hunch of what it would be like if you, um, you know, if you got sober? Did you sort of like have some of those tools in your back pocket? They're going to go, no, I had no clue whatsoever how to do this. Amen? I had no clue whatsoever how to do this. I had to learn how to think in the opposites, just like me. I had to do the exact same thing. I had no clue how to deal with my codependency. I had no clue. Sobriety requires the death of how I have known myself and the way I've been operating and the birth of an identity that is entirely new to me. Here's how the, here's how the Bible talks about that. This is Jesus, uh, John 14. No, I will not abandon you as orphans, he says. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. He's talking about living as a raised, resurrected Jesus, an entirely new identity that even he had never known. When I am raised to life again, here we go, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Man, there is nothing better than that in the scriptures. I want you to hear what Jesus just said. He said, I don't care what kind of shape you're in tonight. I don't care how down and out you are about yourself. I don't care how much you failed. I don't care how much you believe that I don't love you. Here's the good news. The good news for you tonight is that I am gonna come and take up residence in you. Because of my resurrection, you're gonna be a resurrected woman. Tonight, you can be a resurrected man. Tonight, whatever it is you brought in here that is sick and that is eating you alive, you can drop it here at this altar. Tonight, you can drop it at that font. Tonight, that's what Jesus is telling us. It just doesn't get any better than that. That is the good news of Jesus, and that is what sober looks like. In his sweet name, amen.